Where will you go? What will you achieve? It's up to you. This is your adventure, your journey, your very own treasure hunt. Hello, I'm Noah Price, your Christian gamer. Uh, I love RPGs and JRPGs, including Pokemon. I grew up with Pokemon and I haven't missed a game since. I, there hasn't been a mainline game that I haven't beaten. I mean, I've enjoyed every single entry. There are some that I eh, didn't like as much as other <coughs> Sun and Moon, uh, but I was excited for this game. Now, the f announcement of this game and then the, the, the follow-up to it, I, for once, wasn't excited for a new Pokemon game. I enjoyed Legend of Arceus a lot, a lot, but at the same time, I just wasn't excited for a new game. For me, I was like, eh, it's just another Pokemon game. For some reason, just the announcement and everything in it, I just wasn't excited for a new Pokemon game. I was kind of burnt out almost of Pokemon games at this point in time. They weren't interesting me, especially after Gen 8 with Sword and Shield, that game kind of let me down as a Pokemon fan. I mean, it wasn't a bad game, it's just as a Pokemon game, it wasn't amazing, it wasn't good, it was kind of stale. So, I wasn't really excited about this game. I avoided kind of coverage on it, I tried to stay blind as much as possible because just in general, that's what I try to do. I love just taking a game as it is and experiencing it fully that way, without any kind of preconditions and anything to waver me one way or another before even playing the game. But as we got closer and closer, about a week or so before this game came out, I was getting excited for this game, like very excited for this game. And so when it came out, I got it. And we're gonna do this journey of my experience through this game. If you don't know, I like to cover big reviews of this game, take you along on my journey through games, and talk about what was the experience that we just went out of. And yes, I am a Christian, and so I will talk about my beliefs a little bit, if you don't mind. But enough said, let's, let's get into this game. I'm excited, I, we've been taking too long already. Let's go play the game. All right, let's go, let's go. All right, let's go catch them all. Yes, for once, Game Freak has given us a character creation. I know, it's amazing, it's crazy, mind-blowing. And with this character creation, I introduce to you the hero of our journey. Wait! If you need explanation for why his name is uh, what it is, the first two streams I did over on Hero Scrub, uh, I, I, I explain it. So if you want to know why, you just check it out. Either way, this is Plate's application to Uva Academy. I hope they accept us. I did put down that we've been the Pokemon champion multiple times and have completed the Pokedex before. <laughs> After a cutscene that heavily feels like a college welcome video that brags about the school's curriculum and values like individuality. Don't worry, we will talk more about that, but uh, after Plate has done some uh, undercover work at the school first. At this point though, I almost wish they made it look like this was like clearly a video from the school. I, I just feel personally it would have been actually kind of funny and really great. After Plate's first challenge of getting up, we go downstairs where we get to see how far Pokemon homes have gone. No longer are we stuck to a studio apartment. We are in a house. Downstairs, we are introduced to Mr. Cavill, who is the director of Uva Academy. For some reason, he came all the way out here to see us, personally. Oh gosh, what did Plate do this time? Out of fear, Plate goes back to his room to complete his dork outfit with his hat and bag. And then back downstairs, Mr. Cowful tells us to meet him outside, where we finally get to see our Pokemon starters. We got a cat, an apple croc, and of course, Josuke. So we don't pick our starter yet, since that would be too stressful. But instead, Mr. Cowful is visiting a different building. Definitely not a building that would be our rivals. Definitely not, of course not. But the game is nice enough to give us some time with the starters to walk very slowly and get to have time to decide which Pokemon we actually prefer. Now, 
for starters, everyone can agree, especially Plate, that the cat sucks. Sorry, Sanok. <laughs> but I will say that its final form isn't garbage, but it's just a cat, isn't it? Now, normally, I, I would have just chosen Quaxley since, you know, Josuke. But I was spoiled by its final form online, so I, I crumbled to the derpiness of Fuel Coco. I normally pick Fire Pokemon anyways, but I wasn't feeling Fuel Coco at first. But... Then I saw his jaw open face, and what can I say? He won me over with his stunning looks. So yes, after going to the house where Mr. Cavill was, we meet our rival and finally choose Plight Starter by Coco. More about our rival, she's a girl named Nimona, who is also attending the same school as us. Shocker, I know. But what's not a shocker is that she wants to battle us. This will come up a lot, and while this seems normal from the previous games, as we journey through this game more, this might be more of a problem. <laughs> so with Manzana Soul joining this crew, I, I, I gotta explain a small crinkle. We, well, okay, there's more crinkles, but right now for a good chunk of the beginning of this game, Plate was not relaxfully enjoying his adventure, but instead he was restrained by the rules of a Nuzlocke. If you don't know what this is, uh, that's fine because Plate rebels against my ruling so that he could just go and follow his own true treasure of catching Pokemon. Just know that Plate was sweating at the beginning of this game. That's, that's, that's all you gotta know for context reasons. Following the same rules as per usual, Numona gets a starter too, but there is a difference in context here compared to the other games. Plate's rival is not a scrub. She has already started her journey and wants to get a free Pokemon so that she can also start over alongside us on a more equal footing. Again, for more context, this is also because she is a champion ranked trainer. Yep, she is already the champion and wants to start from scratch. Really love the switch up here from the instead of just one champion, there's a ranking of champion. I, I like that for one. That sounds pretty cool and interesting. And also having the our rival already be one is pretty cool. So cool that it's time to battle in Nimona's backyard, which is on the beach. That would be my wife's dream home. We win the fight super easily because, you know, our rival chose the Pokemon we were super affected to because, you know, she's the champion ranked trainer here obviously at least in this game i i can believe in the copium that she's choosing the hard difficulty because she wants an actual challenge this go around but i don't know that's still pretty silly with the fight over we get the pokedex app nonchalantly okay mr cavill takes josuke and nimona and plate finally head off to school where for once we only get a small text box explaining how to catch pokemon which I honestly actually really like. Not far into our journeys, we run into a huge distraction. A Pokemon in pain. Which Pokemon? The legendary box art Pokemon from the beginning trailer. Of course, duh. And no, no, it's getting attacked by the most deadly Pokemon around. How doers? I guess it's a step up from Starly's, but come on, man. Plate falls off the cliff because of course he does, but instead of taking the deadly fall damage, his Rotom casted Featherfall and saved his life. I, I actually really love this because it was already kind of hinted to at before when uh, we were handed our phone. And the second part is it just makes a lot of sense in this world. If there's going to be kids who are just being sent out to the world, uh, might as well give them some kind of device to protect them from falling off cliffs. Thank you, Game Freak. I really love this. I I liked it so much. Um, I mean, it doesn't quite make sense because, you know, inertia and everything, but I, I, thank you, Game Freak. I'll be appreciative. With the Hound Tours gone, because this is a legendary Pokemon after all, we are able to shove a nice, warm, definitely not soggy, sandwich that Plate's mom gave us into this mechanical-looking doggo. And it seemed to work, I think. Wow! What was our mom putting into that sandwich? With nowhere to go but inside the cave, we get to see the box art Mon take some names before Plate and the Mon get sworn by more Mons. A lot of Mons here. Luckily, the box art Pokemon has jets, so, you know. 
barely a problem to get out of here. Sadly, whatever was in that sandwich wore off because the box art mon is just kind of chilling for a bit. But okay, folks, he's back up for round two. Oh, okay, maybe not. But at least it doesn't look like it's about to faint. So that's good. Again, before we continue our journey again, of course, we get distracted by a super unnecessarily angry man. So this is Arvin. He's the professor's son, which is, again, pretty cool thing to have. Besides how first impressions go, Arvin actually knows our box art Pokemon friend here. All that we are told by Arvin is that Maridon, because that's its name, can't fight in this form, and that not just anyone can order it around. So we body a suave it to show our might. And with that, with no problem at all, we obtain Maridon. Roll credits? No? Okay. Basically, we just get Maridon's Pokeball, which makes me ask the question, why can't I use more than six Pokemon in battles? Because now I can carry two extra Mons, counting the legendary Pokemon and Rotom in my phone. I think it's because they mentioned it a couple times of Pokemon having like battle forms and not. Like, I guess that's the reason, but I, I, I don't know, man. I have some questions. While I was busy asking the real questions, Arvin runs away before telling us why he, he knows Maridon and what that's all about. And honestly, I respect it. <laughs> Not a good response. I do have to clarify that it's just, it, it's kind of funny. He's a kid. Of course he would just run away. It makes sense. At the top of the lighthouse, we get our Breath of the Wild moment. Well, that was really more the intro cutscene, but anyways... This is so pretty and not, uh, it looks kind of bad, but it's okay. We'll move on. We got to get to the school. You'll actually see plate try to dodge trainers, but uh, silly him. <laughs> it was too hard to make the game open world and have trainers track you with their eye of sight. So yeah, now, um, trainers actually have to, uh, give their consent before battling trainers. It's weird. Um, probably actually good change, but, um, does kind of bite plate in the butt later on also you know how i said we gotta get to school well what i meant by that was that we gotta explore all of this this beginning area actually gives you a lot to explore like what's under this bridge stuff like that i'm not joking there's a lot that the game just lets you explore at the beginning of the game which honestly i love so much uh but Finally, let's face our first battle out in the wild. You're going down, Elion. Yep, I'm not really sure what I was expecting, but that was a youngster battle, wasn't it? So after more exploring and finding a lot of items, Plate finally learns what a Pokemon Center is. It's definitely uh, a bit different from the last time I've seen it. Even though it seems I'm in the minority of thinking this Pokemon Center looks like a um, gas station i will admit that it does help to save time they got the healing and the shop right next together also having a station for buying slash making tms because that's a thing now i think it's a great improvement for going back to the one use tm method but where you can also make them i think it's a great combination and i'm excited to use it maybe Lastly, the gas station has an area where you can connect online with friends or strangers for a co-op experience for or for trading and battling. Sadly, Plates is alone, so no fun for him. I have another problem with the Pokemon Center. Um, it kind of has to do with how trainers don't assault you once you uh, make eye contact with them, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, Plate was getting a little distracted by... A billion items and new Pokemon to catch all around. I thought it wouldn't take too long to see all the possible Pokemon in this area and then head to the school, but then Plate found this ledge. Now, this ledge looks clearly inaccessible, but Plate really wanted those new Pokemon. So, getting as close as Plate could, he was able to sequence break and get to south area four before we were supposed to and if teleporting over there wasn't enough to realize that the level gap was super clear <laughs> so as you can imagine we get lost here for a bit um we don't really catch a lot of pokemon here yet 
and not because of the level gap but actually because we are at this point still actually trying to attempt to uh do a nuzlocke uh so yeah definitely was scared at this point we do pick up a Gumi though, which we co comically use to body everyone in this early area, including Nimona, who challenged us as soon as we got to the gate before the academy. Nimona was even pretty sweaty in this fight, pulling out the terraform even though we don't even have ours. Still was hardly an inconvenience though. I kind of like that this fight was supposed to be an upward battle, but it didn't really felt that way. Maybe it's because of Gumi, but who's to say? Either way, we are finally at Mesagoza, the biggest place for this game. Kind of weird to throw us at it so soon, but at least it's clear where the school is. Running past a bunch of bad frame rated people, we get interrupted from entering the academy once again. I don't think we're going to make it a school, people. We get interrupted by these goons who clearly want this important not and random npc to join their cult uh called team star or something like that for science i wanted to see if we could have actually just walked away but sadly plate insisted on bodying some goons with his gumi but wait there's more nimona shows up so that she can give us our own terror orb it's also here that she forces the grunts to be a training dummy for us it is a bit mean, but I do actually kind of think it's funny, and I think I'm growing to like Nimona a bit more. Now that we actually have the power to terrestrialize, I should explain what it is and how I feel about it. So, when using the Terror Orb, yes, that's what I'm going to be saying, because I can't always call it what it's supposed to be. Either way, whatever Pokemon you choose to Terra will become the sealed typing of its respected Terra type. Majority of the times it will be the, its first typing, but sometimes you can get a Pokemon with a off-brand Terra type. Beyond just changing typing, it will also make the moves with the same typing as the Terra type much, much stronger. And lastly, besides only getting one use of this before you have to go back to the Pokemon Center to get it recharged, you have to put up with this goofy look. Now, I understand that Pokemon kind of feels like that with new iteration. They kind of have to put in some kind of new gimmick. We've seen this with Mega Evolution. We've seen this with Dynamaxing. And now we got this Terraform. This is probably my least favorite gimmick they've done so far to look at. Again, I, I just think it looks so dumb and goofy, the actual visual part of it. The mechanic-wise, I think it's... Probably one of the best they've done so far. I think it's very creative in what you can do with, and I'm very much looking forward to what it can happen in online battles because of this mechanic. It's just, why does it have to look like this? I think there's so many different ways you could have done this to make it look cool and better. I do understand this is a kids game, so maybe it's a great opportunity to sell more merchandise, because let's remember, that's kind of one of the big ways that this franchise has become so big. It's not through the game alone, but through the anime and the merchandise. So, I guess I can understand if that is truly the reason. Moral of the story, we body Team Star. Then, they use some cheeky Espanol before departing, and we get thanked by the NPC that totally is not random. <laughs> <laughs> totally not right now. But finally, we are going to complete our main objective of finally going to school. I can't believe it's taken us this long. At Uva Academy, we finally take our first class. And oh boy, is that bad. Don't stare, Plate. Please don't stare. Oh, he's, he's, he's totally staring. We meet Jock, the biology teacher. In this game, he's also the person who made the Pokedex free app for everybody's phones. I won't lie, I, I'm pretty excited for what they do with this school setting. Um, I've enjoyed school setting games such as Persona a lot, and so I'm pretty excited for what they can do with this. I'm also kind of scared and hoping that it's not like Sun and Moon, that kind of slow pace, just simply just a tutorial. I hope it's not just that, I hope they can actually make the most of this. Um, I'm a little worried, but I'm going to try to stay hopeful with this. So, classes are optional. So, it's a bit limited at first, but there are different areas at the school that we can 
load into and if there's a exclamation mark there then there's a character that wants to share some story with plate here arvin mentioned that even though he usually he skips class because he's super edgy and too good for it <laughs> don't be like him but he came today to hopefully talk with plate or some help arvin here is all about that picnic life and he needs help with getting some herbs but they are supposedly guarded by some titan pokemon so basically, help take care of the five of them and boom. I had no idea that there were Titan Pokemon in this game, but sounds pretty exciting. I honestly had no idea what this meant, but we soon learned that there are three main plots to this game, and this is one of the three. Before we can leave the cafeteria though, Plate gets hacked, because that's something that could just easily happen, I don't know. Someone named Casopedia has a opposition for us. Call it a main objective. Caspita wants our help to disband the cult, I mean bullies of the Academy called Team Star, and calling the main goal something like Operation Starfall, because it has a star in the name. Before we can find out more, Mr. Cavill shows up, uh, pretty suspicious if you ask me, what do you think, Plate? Okay, never mind, maybe he's not the leader. At the front office, we can actually start taking classes. Right now, we have the first session for biology, math, and battle studies. The first class we take is with Miss Time, who used to be a gym leader, but is now teaching math. Cool. We learn about type matchups and how they make moves more effective. Pretty important to learn, especially to new trainers, like Plate. I was very interested in seeing what lore we learned from Pokemon in the biology class. But for the first session, we just learned that for the most part, Pokemon aren't allowed at the academy. Normally, I'd be disappointed, but my sturdy nature forces me to hold on for the good stuff later. In the battle studies class, I was pretty pumped to get some battles going, but instead we learned the difference between physical and special moves. And again, something that isn't well explained to most new players, but glad to have it here for them. You are going to be hearing that a lot about these classes, to be honest. Heading into the staff room, a Malamar looking person partners us and we talk with Nimona who explains that she's a so what so cool and awesome and really cool. Uh, but also, Nimona also asks us of what's our dream and we tell her that it's about completing the Pokedex and she tells us that that's a lame dream. <laughs> she instead kicks us down and demands that we complete the gym bad challenge and try and be a champion rig trainer. That's totally how it went down. Totally didn't go down any different way. Okay, maybe that didn't fully happen, but Nimona does explain that we have to collect eight gym badges and then take the special champion assessment, <laughs> the Elite Four, and then you can become a champion rank trainer. Same as always. I won't lie. I mean, I keep bringing up Sun and Moon as a bad example. It's it's probably one of my least favorite Pokemon games in the, in, in the mainline series, uh, but... Having Pokemon gym badges here, I'm I'm glad. I didn't know this had to be something I had to be worried about, but even with <laughs> Gen 8, I had to be also worried that oh, is there gonna be gym badges? And I, you know what, Bryce said, I'm I'm glad to see uh, gym badges here. I mean, they didn't have in Legend Arceus, but I didn't even finish that game, which is kind of weird. Really like that game. So Pokemon Violet. <laughs> it's super weird to get to know all the locations of every gym and their typing for that matter just already at the get-go but at the same time I'd, I'd be lying if i didn't say that this was actually kind of getting me hyped to uh become a champion darn you nimona before we could leave the staff room we get called into the director's office because of course we do but before we get into trouble plate noticed miss time so we gotta go say hello obviously and after talking with her we've come closer to her hmm to be honest, I've been playing some Persona recently, and some kind of relationship thing here with teachers worries me a bit, to be honest. But we got no time to worry about that, because at the director's office, we talk with Mr. Cavill, who introduced us to the actual professor of this game, Professor Penguin. I mean, Turo. Turo. Totally, totally Turo. Didn't... What? The professor basically tells us to take care of Maridon. The catch is that it's not battle ready, because... Yeah, of course they're not going to give us the legendary already. That'd be crazy, right? 
the bright side is we are able to ride it so that's something but besides that and basically trading contact information um that's really was all we get with the professor it's kind of weird having a pokemon game where you're not being told to go catch them all um sorry plate guess you're gonna be alone on this journey <laughs> Afterwards, we get introduced to our very own dorms, which are extremely forgettable, but it's okay because when we choose to go to sleep, we are instead comatose and we time skip to the end of the tutorial. Smooth Pokemon. So, yeah, the reason for students to go on a adventure in this game is uh, as a independent study called the treasure hunt, where you go out to find your dream or purpose, something like that. While this screams heavy on the idea of individuality and finding yourself, so far, I think it really works, at least in the context of this world of Pokemon and, and why would kids be sent out to go on an, a Pokemon adventure? So, Count Plate and I on board. But even though Nimona is biased and would love our treasure to be becoming a champion ranked trainer, there is also Arvin. I really love this dynamic of them trying to get you to either choose gym battles or that picnic life. But wait, there's more. Cast Calls reminds us of their plot line. Literally all three plot lines fighting against each other. Cast does explain that there are five bosses of Team Star that we gotta beat, each one with a different typing because of course they do. So fighting of a main plots do serve a small point, besides just being really funny. They are basically starting points for your journey. If you want to do the gym challenges, then you are recommended to go to the left, but if you want that picnic life, then maybe go to the right. Definitely appreciate the helpful nudge without being forceful, but we are gonna do what we wanna do. So yes, Pokemon has finally done it. They have made an open world Pokemon game. And where does Plate choose to start his adventure in this game? You'll have to find out next time on th this the same video. It's still going on, but where is he going to pick? Let's find out. Back at the beginning of the game to catch them all. I wasn't sure if Superman lived here at first, but it turns out that this is where you do the new raid battles. My bad. Terra raid battles. Now, there have been some tweaks to raid battles. It's not more than three deaths and you lose, but now there is just simply a time consequence for getting knocked out. This new version of raid battles is way better in my opinion. This is just a one-star raid battle so it's easy but we'll check out a five-star raid battle later and see if it still holds up if i actually remember to do that well, well we'll see but either way after the raid battle we fully walk away from attempting to nuzlocke this game and we head back to the first route of poke path and try to catch every pokemon here that we can i, I i'm not saying that you can't Nuzlocke this game you definitely can it's just it with how the zones are it's definitely not a normal like, Nuzlocke experience I, I couldn't force plate to not follow his his treasure 
So moving from Pokepath, we head to Area 1 to catch the massive amount of Pokemon we can catch while avoid terror battles, of course. Even though I enjoyed the differences to the new raid battles, I, I still don't want to get overpowered by getting a bunch of XP candies from the raid battles. And that's partially why I don't love raid battles so much. It's just because you're given so many candies and items that it's just, it's so easy to just over level. I do appreciate it because it is a great mechanic for late game for if you want to level up a party really quickly for competitive, just playing through the game. I have to force myself self-control to limit myself to not use the resource. It just it doesn't make sense as a game component to the player experience as to it just allows you to overlevel. And so forcing myself to not overlevel feels weird. Feels weird. In this area, we were able to get our treasure loot dude. Nice. Back at the sequence break area 2, we find some very cool Pokemon like Drippy. I tried catching Mistrevious because it was recommended at the bottom of the Pokedex, but when I did catch it, nothing happened besides recommending and hinting at the location of its second form. I don't hate it, but I was honestly had no idea what it was about and was expecting more from it. But while catching all the Pokemon in this area, we got our first Metamorbing with a random Starly we picked up. While at Area South 2, we take on our first Terra Wild Pokemon. And after barely surviving, we were able to actually catch this beast. Which, after thinking I had caught everything at South Area 2, uh, there's more. But after finally catching all the Pokemon I can with no abilities besides just jumping, we are finally going to be able to move forward. To preference, I'm roughly seven and a half hours into this game and we technically haven't left the tutorial area but now it is finally time to head west out of the three main goals of disbanding team star acquiring the titans and taking on the gym badges the titans almost feel like the highest priority only because i heard news that our legendary ride unlocks its true power and lets us have more mobility if we actually take on the titans so of course i'm gonna start there we will have to make a pit stop at a gym first since Plate is having some troubles controlling our mods that are growing stronger than level 20. Ugh, there is a bug gym right off the bat, but this is an open world Pokemon game. So I want to try and see how they decided to do that. I'm hoping that it will be that if we defeat a gym, the next gym, then it raises its level cap. I'm, I'm a bit afraid that it might not be the case, but either way, Plate is hopeful as we start our journey towards the water gym, since that will be one of the harder gyms for us. Also, this is my new team so far, after giving up on the Nuzlocke challenge. And before we can even begin to beeline for a targeted gym, Plate got sidetracked with catching more Pokemon. Stop collecting Pokemon, Plate. Let us do one objective first, please. The bright side is that since Plate scraped the first few areas, a lot of the Pokemon we are seeing now running around are Pokemon we already have, so at least that'll save us a little bit of time. I did have to remind Plate to uh, battle some trainers as we go along here, uh, mostly because if we have to keep up uh, Plate's uh, problem with catching Pokemon, <laughs> we're going to need some money to be able to keep buying Pokeballs for that. Move forward, we find our next Terror Wildmon, who we whoop on and capture. We then make it to Cortondo, which is where the bug gym is. And so while I would like to explore this town, we are going to try to skip it. Ooh, football. But as Plate tries to continue, um, the plague of glitches coming from Violet has affected my own Elgato, forcing it to stop recording. Okay, not really, but what I mean is that it got the audio still going, but not the visuals working. So I lost about <laughs> two hours of footage. Uh, great. It's not like within that two hours I made progress through one gym and beat a whole team star within that time. Okay, I'm lying. That's exactly what happened. Okay, I'm not crying. You are. 
let me explain. So off screen, we took on our first team star because they blocked the path going forward to deal with the water gem. I really enjoyed this team star battle because it first starts off with the challenge of using the new let's go feature. And then after winning that, we fight the main boss. The boss fight wasn't too hard but the story we got afterwards was pretty intriguing it seems we'll get a bit more information about the forming of team star after each encounter with them even though normally i'm not crazy about the bad guys not being bad like team yell i think they won me over or at least have started to so after team star we made our way to cast karifa which is the location of the water gym each gym has their own gym test that you have to complete before getting to take on the gym leader. This gym's gym test is racing across the desert to give the gym leader his wallet. I personally really love this test since traveling to new places is a big part of the game. It's just exploring. And the idea of being somebody who has already been to the town and just getting to make this test a joke by teleporting there kind of makes me smile for that person. Past the desert, making our way to the port town, we got to find the spot for getting your ditto. Want to know about that? I really, really love how the ditto is transformed into a Pokemon in the wild. While I can see it being annoying for shiny hunters, I, oh, I just really love it. It just is like, yes, yes, that makes sense and it works so well. Luckily, that's all we lost. Way more than I wanted, but hopefully this doesn't happen again. After getting bodied and then bodying the gym leader's pushy assistant, we give the gym leader Kofu his wallet back. But the gym test is not over. Now Kofu wants us to help him with auctioning. With him giving up money to do this, it wasn't hard to win. Just do the highest bid. Probably not exactly what Ko Kofu wanted, but I guess it didn't really matter in the first place because after winning, Kofu then gave us money but since we won, Kofu heads back to his gym and we are able to finally test out and see what the gym badges are based on. Are they based on already set levels or is it on the system that I'm hoping for? Oh, and uh, actually, before we actually go out, speaking of auctions, uh, I'm just going <laughs> to uh, go towards this action and uh, try to get some quick balls because let's be honest, quick ball is probably one of the best pokeballs in the game not gonna lie highly worth it yep nope uh 17,600 is definitely worth it for 19 quick balls okay okay right. back to the gym badges i guess we meet nimona who is weirdly glad that we're taking on the gym challenge and after that we take on kofu our first gym leader ah no <laughs> So, this gym feels like the third gym challenge. Kofu's Pokemon are about low 30s. Now, I do have Pokemon that are close to his level, again, from just catching every Pokemon I can, but the true problem comes with the fact that since I don't have any gym badges already, these Pokemon don't want to listen to our main man, Plate. Plate, you gotta give out some alpha energy. You can't be a beta male. So Plate and I uh, did keep challenging Kofu until we could beat him, and I would show you that. But of course, this happened again. Elgato, why? So, with another two hours of lost footage, I of course chose to make progress. Because I can't just lose hours catching Pokemon in the wild. Obviously not. Uh, Plate and I, we uh, took on two more gyms and two titans. I'll explain what happened with the gyms, but I'll actually show what happened with the two Titans encounter since I really like the story there and uh, I think it's worth talking about. Don't worry, I, I stopped recording from Elgato, so uh, there will not be any more problems like this. <laughs> so in order, after taking care of the water gym, we dealt with the Quaking Earth Titan in the desert. We then, because we were already over level past our first badge benefit we then decided to take on the normal badge which while it was harder level wise it was still easier than the water gym the gym test was actually really fun with battling other students stuff like this i think really helps to make the game really feel like i'm not the only trainer doing these challenges and surprisingly while i'm not too crazy about the school uniforms i do think they help with that 
either way, this was the final nail that confirmed that each challenge is a set specific level. Hate to see it. Uh, I, I still think the other methods way funner and way better and way flexible, but I, you know what? I should be appreciative that we have a open world game in the first place. Also the, the gym leader here, Larry, very cool. There's more to say about him, but no footage. So sorry. Yay. More evolutions. It's hard to say that I have a main team because it's kind of easy to over level, especially if plate just catches every Pokemon you can and then tries to battle gyms and different places that are low level. So plate's team has been pretty fluid where depending on what gym we fight, uh, we'll make a specific team for it. It's actually been pretty different, but pretty fun. The next badge plate got was the bug gym badge. Not much to mention here. This gym challenge was super easy and really felt like the first gym you're supposed to take on. We grabbed this badge so that I could widen the gap even more of how strong a Pokemon will actually listen to us since it has been a bit annoying for our Pokemon to just not listen to play at all. We then took on the Flying Titan Pokemon, which it's finally time to show you uh, what I couldn't record but the story of the Titan Pokemon because boy, so far, oh, I really, really love it. First off, thanks to Callum, Mr. Nazarene on YouTube for the cutscenes. Oh, and on the bright side of us watching this, we get to see what it looks like on the other version of this game. Neat. So after getting the HM, Arvin makes some sandwiches for us, which we end up actually giving to our legendary Pokemon because he's such a hungry boy. Arvin doesn't really like this, but it feels more like he doesn't like the legendary Pokemon just in general. Besides our legendary Pokemon getting boosted by the sandwich, that's all that happens with the first Titan encounter. Well, except we are left with Arvin thanking us, and then laying out a Pokemon before we pan away. Mysterious! So after we beat our second Titan, that we start to really learn more. Everything starts off the same with another chow down with some sandwiches and even some hungry Pokemon, but this time it's different. When the legendary Pokemon tries to snag some seconds, Arvin just freaks out. And after calming down, Arvin finally reveals why we are truly seeking out that picnic life. Letting out his boy Mabostiff, his partner Pokemon, he shares with it the HM sandwich and explains that Mabostiff is hurt to the point where Pokemon Santers can't help him. Desperate, Arvin has been looking everywhere for solutions including in the <coughs> Violet book for answers, which is where he learned of the HMs. Supposedly, if you get all five, it can cure any ailment. And after the second sandwich, Mopostiv is finally able to open its eyes. This has to be one of my favorite plot lines in any Pokemon game. Arvin so far has been very much portrayed in a way that this is a believable situation in a Pokemon game. The closest we've ever gotten to this, I feel, is with the original Gen 1. Uh, the idea of possibly Gary losing his Pokemon, of death being on the table. And seeing Arvin here struggle with that, and I, to be honest, I thought this might lead to death, and we'll just see what happens, but I really love this, and I'm excited to see more of what this story has to do. So what I'm trying to say is yes, as you can already tell, we are going to go and try to help out Arvin and his buddy as soon as possible. Fake dragon at the lake, here we come. Did I say uh, rush, rush over? Uh, oops. <laughs> so uh, it was about this time that Plate reminded me that uh, we do have some classes we need to take and Plate not being one to skip classes, uh, we rush over to start our first real school arc. To start with, we have more places and classes to take. These places are really not actually spots to explore, but we do get more exclamation marks, so then we can bond more with adults. Super weird. Again, though, we will hold off on that. First, classes. From the Battle Studios, 
First half of the classes, we learn about terror raid battles and how you can cheer to heal your fellow Pokemon. And then we had our own midterm, where we had to answer the same questions we were given during the classes. I'm still getting so much Persona vibes from this game, but okay. With Plates Paralysis, we got a perfect score and was rewarded with five small XP candies. I don't know if that's really was worth it, but now it's time to do some bonding with our confidant. With Dendra, the battle student's teacher, we get a free sandwich for working out with her. But the plot point here is that she's not that great at making sandwiches. Should I gave it to Maridon? Plate then heads to the biology room to talk with his favorite teacher, Jacques, who made the Pokedex. Jacques' story is very simple, fill out the Pokedex, which Plate is glad to help out with. Back at Dendra's story arc, she is now in the home ec room to do some sandwich training, which while getting better, still has a ways to go, at least for Plate's standards. Plate then visits Mr. Cavill, who has some question about slang, because, you know, he's be old and everything. This one takes a bit because uh, I had to look up. I, I myself didn't even know how to pronounce this word. Uber weird. Also, I, I know it's a small thing, but this bug persists for most of the game. I think it has something to do with the first Pokemon we have in our party, but either way, it it's a bit distracting in cutscenes. In the nurse's office, Blake meets the nurse Miriam. You know when you see a character and you could just feel they were designed for people to crush on? This is one of them. Not my thing. I got a wife, but hopefully Plate isn't smitten. So far, her story is that she loves to hear the student's stories when they come in. Basically, uh, here's the situation. Little Timmy comes in crying that his radicate is almost dead, and she's like, So, what happened? Tell me everything. Back in classes with Jock and Biology, we got to learn about the breeding lore of Pokemon. Kinda. Sadly, it was a bit vague since this is a kid's game, but it does share that if you want to do some, uh, have a Pokemon with have a picnic with two Pokemon and blam! Egg in the basket. Next session, we got to learn more about the history about Jock and when he was more of a researcher with Dr. Cavill. Weird. But then, before spoiling more of the story, he taught Plate about how to catch Pokemon more easier by torturing. I mean, hurting the Pokemon, but put, put it into submission. And that was it before the midterm, which Plate passed. I also really loved uh, the last question. It reminded me of midterms I used to take at uh, Boys Bible College while I was still attending. Uh, it's just always funny to fill out these types of questions at the end of big tests. It's funny. For math with Miss Time, we first learn about the life hack of getting a free Premier Ball for just buying 10 Boogie Balls. Sadly, not history as to why they do that, but still love that that is a thing. We then learn about crits and about how much damage it's actually given because of it, which is sadly something I didn't actually knew. Thanks, Pokemon. Play for his return was able to get a perfect score. <laughs> That nerd. <laughs> and with math class being done for now, we can get more story from Miss Time. She's getting stalked. Thought this was going to be a lighthearted with a Pokemon, but nope. Just a serious problem that doesn't get solved right now. Okay. Not that bad. Uh, it is mentioned that it's probably just a shy student, but still kind of, kind of weird. It was at this point, though, that Plate was able to find a very interesting book. Basically, a big lore book about the crater in Area Zero. And it's just chilling here in the entrance hall. Weird. But speaking of history, time for history class with Rayford. Rayford. I don't know. How do you pronounce that? I really don't like her. I, I'll be honest. I, I don't know why, but I do like her classes, though. Just because we actually get to learn more about the lore of this game. Stuff like what exactly is at the bottom of Area Zero, the Paladian Empire that used to exist, and exactly why and when the Academy came to be. So far, I've been super interested in the lore they've been dishing out, and I'm grateful they're giving us some. Uh, and Plate was paying attention because he got a perfect score. <laughs> Look at him go. And after talking about liking the past with uh, Ravor, Plate started his language classes. While I like the idea of this class, since this region is based off Spain, teaching some Spain lingo could be cool, but honestly it was more complicated than anything. 
luckily, what little Spanish I still have remembered has helped out a little bit. So, Plate was able to pass. Hanging out with Salvatore, Plate was able to help a not-so-Pikachu out. Now, time for one of my favorite classes. Art! I mean, how could you not like this class? Really, this class is more of a philosophy class of what art is, since art is, in most cases, is subjective. But we also get to learn a little about which terror type a Pokemon turns into by how it looks, because we can all agree it's hard to tell what Gibble is right now. On the midterm for this class, we pass with a perfect score. And then afterwards, hanging out with Mr. Hassel, we learn something troubling with his family. Mm -mm, super mysterious. Mm, what could it mean? Now for the final class, Homewreck. This class probably makes the most sense for the setting. In a world where kids are being sent out on their own in the wild, it might be good to learn about setting up campus. It could be important. So we learn about egg power and sandwiches, which is something I will never use. Sorry, Cigarro. So after passing his midterm, we were finally done with classes and could head back to our journey. Oh, that took so long. Time to hunt down the body of the false dragon titan. Oh boy. Just making the journey from Medali was tough. Around Medali, there was some Pokemon that Plate had to catch causing several of our team's Pokemon to evolve, including our starter, making our croc even more crocky. I'm not the most crazy about this design, but I do like it a bit more than the other starters finals form. So in comparison to those, I, I guess I like it. But even though it evolved, even with that slight improvement, uh, we were super underleveled once we landed across the river. All the bonds here, we're in their 50s. With some hints from Arvin to uh, go to the lake, we dodged as many Pokemon as we can before we got to the Titan. Honestly, I was starting to get a bit worried about this, uh, but after surviving some battles against, you know, some wrong sounding sushi, we found the thick Titan boy. Oh my God, watch out plate. After several attempts, with several buffs, we were finally able to barely force the catfish to flee. Yeah, yeah you, you better run. So, of course, we uh, begin to do a bit of grinding and, uh, well, slash, really just filling out the Pokedex more. And Blade heads over to the island next to where we fought the one catfish. And look who we find. Someone seems a bit mad. Luckily, Arvin joins the party and we bodied the catfish once again with much more ease now that we actually have another body to get hit. But now it was a trick. We got to actually take care of the sushi that was taking control of the catfish. Luckily, we got our health restored, so it was another easy fight. Yeah, take that fish S sushi. All right, time to get some of the kaiju juice for the doggo. Sitting down together, we have another fun encounter of sandwich being made for the two of us. But in the end, both trainers, Plate and Arvin, sharing the food with their pals. Unlocking more features with Maraidon, too. And also obtaining more hope with Mabostiv. I'm still loving the story so much. Now, being able to climb, Plate explores more of the False Dragon's lair, trying to still catch Pokemon above our pay grade. And finding another one of these swords. I've been so excited about what these swords are about. Obviously, they seem to be some kind of four wild legendaries in the late game. Um, I love that how Pokemon doesn't just have the one box art legendary, but introduces more. Okay, yes, it does kind of contradict with the idea of if there's a bunch of legendaries all over the place, all around, then what makes them so special? There's so many of them. What's so special about it? But... For me, what it really emphasizes a lot is that the legendary not being just solely connected with the main story. It's just other legendaries out in the wild. And I think it adds more variety and makes the one that is in the story more special and the ones that are not. I don't know. For me, it makes it more believable in my, in my mind, at least. 
Now with the third and probably one of the hardest Titans done, I'm feeling pretty confident that we can finish off the Titans first and help our boy Matt Bostiff as soon as possible. So time to probably head down to what was some people's first part of their venture with heading to the bottom right into the South Province Area 3. Just starting off with finding this trainer here. Oh my gosh, plates super over leveled. Oh my gosh. Also, it's kind of funny to see how much this area was clearly for a beginner's journey. Like with this maze like canyon that is super easy to cross since Plate can just jump and climb everywhere. After catching a lot of Pokemon in this area and finding another mysterious sword, we were going to make a bunch of progress. But then I remember that we haven't explored the beginning area since getting all of our mobility. So Plate forced us to go back to catch even more Pokemon in the beginning area, which we also find another one of these mysterious swords. Yes, yes. And the late game plot thickens. Mm, yes. After about probably 20 minutes of exploring, we finally made it back to the South Province, where we were able to find and take on the next Titan Pokemon, who is this Stony Cliff Titan. We were just exploring, and we just found the little bugger hanging on a cliff. It was so goofy, but this honestly made me laugh. I've already seen this Pokemon from trailers, so I wasn't surprised by it, but it was still funny and honestly probably a little creepy to find it in this way. After bodying it with my normal type Eevee, we chase it down to its lair where Arvin joins the party once more, so that we can even more easily er, er, wipe it out. Super silly and super easy, but I don't know, it's kind of fun to uh, do things out of order a bit. Sandwich time! With the help of this sandwich, Maridon was finally able to dash. Yes, Reddit shoes finally unlocked. Arvin brings up that it's probably mental trauma that caused Maridon to have regressed like it has, which is cool. Well, okay, not the trauma thing, but the use of it as a story mechanism, because humans aren't the only ones that can have trauma. With no big recovery effects from this sandwich, I was slightly worried for Arvin's Mabostiff, but we still had hope for the final herb to finally recover the good boy. I personally think it'd be funny to just fully just race to the final titan even though even though there are some gym challenges and team star members next to us okay fine 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 we'll do some gym challenges here in artisan we are greeted to a choppy windmill and some sunflower statues can you guess that this is the grass gym town Something that has been super enjoyable in Pokemon games is seeing the unique towns that each game has. I feel like this town and a few others are the only towns that really feel like they are trying to stand out with being a certain style, while just being honestly meh. Besides Mesagoza, which feels like it's supposed to be the main town, there hasn't really been a town that I wanted to explore. I think that might be partially to do with not being able to even go inside other people's houses. It's hard to describe it, but while this game is focused on exploring and going at your own pace, I had no urge to explore any town or city that this game gave. I extremely started to notice that with this town. Either way, after talking with two strangers, uh, one being our art teacher and the other being Rika, one of the Elite Four, Kind of love that we get to meet some of the Elite Four early on. Kind of cool. But sadly, because this is open world, it's, it's kind of harder to write scripted events. So this felt kind of bland because I was already kind of expecting this since this is a gym leader. And before every gym, we talk to somebody. So in that sense, it's kind of ended up being a little boring. Either way, we are here for the gym. So uh, in order to take on the gym... We have to take on this first test, which we have to first find 10 sunflowers and then corral them into this area. I assume this is a challenge by fooling trainers with the statues, but this was super easy. <laughs> the bright side was just having a gaggle of sunflowers just following you at the end of this. It, honestly, it's a great sight to see. 
but with the floors turned in, we could finally take on the grass gym of Artisan. Without even using our main team members, we were able to eliminate the other team with our fire and flying type Pokemon. In our journey, this is when we really stopped using our main team due to just starting to deal with gyms and stuff that are at a lower level. Plate would just start making a team out of what we had type-wise to face our opponents. Uh, it still feels super foreign to play a Pokemon game like this, but deciding to not just use our main team for every battle actually, as mentioned before, was kind of fun in its own way. It made Plate and I feel way more tactical with our choices for upcoming threats. Like, oh, we see this gym, it has this kind of typing. Well, let's create a team specifically to take it down. It's fun. Uh, speaking of upcoming threats, now that we have four batches, we can keep journeying up to the last Titan Pokemon with zero obstacles in our way. Yes, after countless more Pokemon caught while exploring and leaving Artisan, we ran into our next Team Star. We are joined once again by the super cool Mr. Clive, which I didn't mention, but yeah, this is uh, Mr. Clive. Yeah, he's he's kind of telling us a little bit of his intent as to why he's joining the operation to learn more about uh, the situation that's truly going on with Team Star, Get, getting the real facts. Um, but yeah, it's Mr. Clive, a very, very cool dude. We get another word from Castle Spia to be cautious uh, before Plate just rushes in to take the other base. Now, I was honestly pretty excited to see what was going to be the new challenge here, because we've already seen the first challenge, which made use of the Let's Go feature and, and making use of that, but I was pretty excited to see what was going to be the challenge here, what was going to be the new gimmick that we were going to have to play with. Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we're just going to be using the Let's Go feature for every Team Star race. I don't hate using this mechanic, but I have a feeling that this is going to get pretty stale. Unless they increase the difficulty of this for later star bases. After defeating the, the challenge, which was super easy, we face Mela, the boss of this base. And once more, Team Star disappoints. <laughs> when the first Team Star boss rode the car Pokemon with speakers, it made sense since it seemed like his thing was music and speakers. But seeing it here shows that this is just what every Team Star boss is going to have. It just seems like another element that could have been interesting to look forward to, but instead it's just going to be boring due to it being monotonous. When it came to the fight itself, it wasn't nothing. The Star Mobile at the end was actually able to body most of Plate's team and force us to use some switching tactics and exploring the overpowerful items called revives. Boy. I am still waiting the day with other main Pokemon trainers start using revives. Probably won't happen because it could just make battles longer than they need to be, but I do kind of like the idea of trainers getting used what the players get to use. After defeating Mela, we get another flashback about all of the team bosses talking and informing us of how Mela was bullied for being too cute and how she now puts on a mean attitude as a facade. Could have shown up flashback of us seeing that instead of just getting a flashback of them talking about the situation um but i guess them sitting around or standing around all together in the same spot as we saw before will save money so again <laughs> a bit of another like down <laughs> <laughs> After the flashback, Mr. Clyde talks with Mela about her choices and how the Char Cadet has missed her not being at school, and Plate gets his second Team Star badge, even if it means a broken hand. Now, there is truly nothing in Plate's way for him to deal with the last Titan and help out Arvin's boy. Okay, after even more exploring from Plate, we make it to the brightly lit city of Lavincia, where we just stopped by for the Pokemon Center before we race towards the last Titan. No more distractions, I swear. Okay, except for catching more wild Pokemon. I'm, okay, I'm not crazy. I know Plate's interest, okay? North of Lavincia, we do make it to the last Titan Pokemon who lives in these canyons, and boy what a last titan to find <laughs> whoa so it was a snake not gonna lie kind of thought it was, might have been a crab with its mouth for him oh my god never mind that <laughs> that works too i guess 
Uh, Growlithe was still able to take care of it by itself, uh, chasing after the gamer raging worm. Yep, that's what I'm going to call it. And having Arvin join the fight again, we bully the last Titan Pokemon. I could hold out for a sneaky last Titan Pokemon, but if that was all the Titans, then I'm going to be honest, I was slightly disappointed. Uh, to preference, I, I mean the specific Pokemon we face. Um, I was hoping for more of what we first faced with the Paradox Pokemon. Um, sadly, again, because of Elgato crashing, I didn't get to show. But yeah, no, there was a Paradox Pokemon. I was hoping we would see more of that. But instead, we fought who we fought. Either way, that gripes out of the way. There's no time to waste or to be bitter because it's finally time to help out Armin's boy. With attaining Arvin's last badge and collecting all of the five HMs, Maridon is able to jump higher. I, uh, yeah, I know. It's a weird choice. Honestly, thought it was going to be able to fight, but that's not really solved through mental trauma. So I'll let it slide. But more importantly... While I'm happy to help out Arvin and his boy, I, I won't lie. I was a little disappointed. I, I know, I know, I can't be satisfied. I did like this a lot. I, I It's probably one of my favorite plot lines to ever follow in a Pokemon game. I know I've said it before, but I still believe that this is probably one of my favorite ever that they've done in the mainline series. For sure, for sure. But even still looking back at it and thinking about it, like looking back at Gen 1 or even Sun and Moon, they had it where Pokemon dying is a reality. It's something that happens. While in the main games, while playing through and combat wise, Pokemon only faint, there are still stuff like graves. There are, are cemeteries that are dedicated to Pokemon dying. And so I don't think it would be just out of blue to have it here where this person is struggling with the idea that his Pokemon's gonna die and trying to prevent it even though Pokemon are gonna die at some point. I think that could have been a very interesting topic to deal with. And so that's why there's this slight, ever so slight disappointment because I thought they could have just swerved and had it where, yeah, even though Arvin's fighting his hardest to keep his Pokemon alive, we're all going to die at some point. And so having that there could be an interesting topic to talk about in a Pokemon game, even if it is for kids. Still, still a very good uh, plot line either way. I, I still need to like clarify that i still love this a lot that was just something that came to my mind that i thought of that could have been debatably maybe better maybe not though arvin is contacted by his dad and asked to go open the lab since i guess he locked his dad in yeah the very same one that was at the beginning of the game I hope he's fine. <laughs> Beyond possibly killing your dad by locking him in, I actually relate a lot with this sentiment. I held on to so much anger towards my parents for how they seemed to only command me around. My family owned their own farm, and so with that, that meant, you know, I was one of the workers. Work had to be done. And in a lot of cases, it, it, the line blurred from son to worker at times at least it felt that way for me personally sometimes it just felt like all that would happen is i get told what to do and didn't get that personal actual connection so i understand what it feels like to be feeling neglect and there's there's other to it but that's just one example in my life and seeing pokemon tackle this this topic was interesting i loved it i i mean i already kind of mentioned it of this rawness but 
I think more topics that that Pokemon's able to deal with or present in this game or, or in new games, I think the reason why these hit so hard home is that they're real. The real topics that people really deal with throughout their lives. And so seeing it here, it just makes the story so much more believable, so much more impactful. It's not something that's make believe, it's believable. A lot of people have actually dealt with it or are still dealing with it. And I, I'm glad that they're doing this. I'm glad they're talking about real topics. Because again, it's powerful. You could do a lot with this. And it doesn't feel cheap like they're using it just so that people can relate with it. But they're using it because it's a, they want to tell a certain story. And I love that. I think it's been great. And I know I related with it and I really enjoyed Arvid's probably my favorite character in this story, and that has to do with a lot of the issues and pain he's going through. Like, I can relate with that, you know? So, I think that's really good, and I love it. I mean, I, I think I do have to say this now. I mean, for anybody who are struggling with this, I relate with you, and I'm sorry that you have to struggle through that. It's painful. It sucks. It's not ideal. I know it's not what God wanted for us in this world, this broken, sinful world, but he loves you. I know God is is the best father for you, and so I just want to let you know that God does love you. I love you, even though I don't know you that well. I would love to know you better. I do know God does know you and loves you, and so, you know, just let you know. You have a good father, at least in that sense. I know I do, at least. And if there's more you want to talk about, uh, not just related to just Jesus and God, but even that pain and that struggle, you could always leave a comment down below. If it's a little bit too personal and you don't want to deal with that because I could understand not really wanting to do a uh, open up to just in the comments where someone could just chime in I can understand that vulnerability being a little bit too much <laughs> it's a lot to ask uh so if you want to just talk to me you could go to my twitter at uh hero scrub you could probably see it down below maybe right now it's in in the description at the very least you could message me down there anytime I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible I do am busy a lot but I will do my best to come back and Talk with you, because I think it's important. With the Path of Legends completed, we finally make our way back to the lab with Arvin. Maybe we'll finally meet the professor face to face. Back at the lighthouse. Finally, for the first time ever, we finally head into the professor's lab. At this point, it's just funny that we don't meet the professor in person, but again, only through a screen. It turns out the professor is at area zero and is stuck, and it seems he needs our help. We gotta bring the Violet book down to area zero. Sounds pretty easy, but I guess since it's a dangerous place, we'll have to first gather some allies. But before that, Arvin wants to battle us. It's kind of weird that we haven't fought him since the first time we've met. But I'm excited to go up against him. I'm curious what level his Pokemon are. Oh, oh no. Well, maybe if I crit, I could... Uh, 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 never mind. So Arvin totally begged us to postpone our fight. Totally not sinning, that would be a lie. Uh, we do decide to start taking care of some Team Star as we head north to finish the gym challenge. Seems pretty obvious that the allies we need to go down in Era Zero is going to be Nimona and probably Penny. Either way, Plate gotta do some leveling up, and what better way than gym challenges? Yes, we'll also be catching Pokemon too. Can't deny that Plate has been hard at work with uh, at least seven boxes filled already. Pretty nice. So after heading west to Zappapico and then heading north through Della Zappa Passage and entering the snow zone, we finally made it to the next Team Star base. 
at the front gate, Mr. Clive explains again why he joined the fight of taking down Team Star for some reason. Uh, before Plate just charged in, whooping on all the poison type these trainers had. We then got to face the wannabe ninja, Atticus. All that Plate had to do was bring out Crocodile and get Moxie going, and then there was no shot for Atticus. And it was at this point I was starting to snooze when we got Atticus's flashback. The only interesting part was actually getting to see how she looked. I'm lucky that Plate is here so that I can kind of just go on autopilot through the rest of the Team Star Captains until we get to the end. Because again, we are going through the same motions we did with the last two captains. We continue our journey upwards. While I want to beamline it to the two gyms at Gosado Mountain, Plate decides to be efficient by detouring slightly northeast to take on another Team Star boss. I know, I miss this is you for another easy challenge. So, in the northeast of Paldea, we have an interesting biome of bamboo. I do like that the game is trying to give different interesting areas. So far, I personally don't think they are necessarily winners, but they aren't nothing. They clearly just feel like areas put in the game to be interesting and not areas that I can associate with the game's identity. Plate gets asked what he thinks of Casabia from Mr. Clive and Honestly, at this point, they haven't set up someone new to be this mysterious person, so it's pretty obvious that the Caspia is actually Penny. Now, why she's trying to shut down Team Star is still a question mark. It's been pretty clearly written that all the bad stuff that people know of Team Star is not all true. So at the very least, we still have that mystery. Eerie, the boss, was just at the front gate. So I thought this was going to be a super quick, but after being persuaded to act like a normal boss, we are greeted to another almost run and go mini game. Let's be honest, that's what it is. My main problem is that the mode is general, isn't hard, and the fact that the only thing that makes it different is that the Pokemon are different types. But beyond that, there's nothing different. Nothing new being happening here, and it's, uh, it's nothing. Speaking of the same old, same old, Yuri, like the other bosses, roll out on another star mobile. We all know how this is going to go. Let's get this over with. Okay, so, uh, yeah, she's she's tough. She She's tough. So, switching up our team slightly and being slightly slimy, <laughs> we were able to barely beat her on our second try, which I was actually surprised. That was what I get for talking so much trash. We get yet another flashback about how this group was bullied and outcasted, but in the end, we're able to find their own belonging with each other. We only have one last boss to beat for Team Star, and I'm really not looking forward to it. Fairy type is still foreign to me, and I haven't missed a game yet, so it's kind of a surprise that it's so foreign to me. Either way, time to keep heading north so that we can actually snag some snowy gems. Okay, that that was my plan. But once again, Plate decided to instead, yep, yet again, do some exploration. This was for the sake of catching more Pokemon, of course. So when talking about impact on Plate's journey, this wasn't anything crazy. But at the same time, it was more impactful than the Team Star boss fights I, I had with Aerie. I've mentioned it before, but the exploration mechanic in this game insanely captures a major part of Pokemon. Just the idea of what Pokemon I might find makes me want to keep searching every crook and cranny. Maybe while searching, I could find a rare evolved Pokemon. That possibility alone was fueling my veins with excitement still. Thinking about it now, if this didn't work so well, I probably would have fallen off of this game, but Plate and I are still just having a blast. 
again it's not perfect a lot of the areas that are just reused do make the game less impactful with its identity but being able to just find a random spear tome like this is amazing and i could just think of a younger me going wild over finding pokemon just like this speaking of freaking out as a kid in a pokemon game cooperation like real cooperation not just being stuck in a small room to battle and trade but actually being able to play a pokemon game together now i didn't get to play around with this too much to know its limits but from what i've heard it's vast from what you can do together which the more is obviously better yes i did use my friend to help fill out plates pokedex even more okay <laughs> now my friend did mess up okay it's his fault he ended up getting uh violet which i already had so uh sorry plate uh <laughs> i guess plate will have to still struggle with uh figuring out how to get the scarlet exclusive pokemon but hey at least i have palafin which my friend wasn't ready for seeing it out in battle for the very first time but while my co-op experience was short i still had a great time showing my friend around including the secret sequence spot that doesn't help you but is fun and this would have been super enjoyable if i was a child still playing pokemon games with my brother this co-op experience with trade evolutions and palvin reminded me something there are a lot of unique evolution pokemon one of them being prime now i wouldn't say that prime needed an evolution but if you use rage fist a bunch lore wise Primeape dies and then evolves into Annihilate. Now, I love Palafin, but boy, is Annihilate a close second. I can't even imagine something else just beating those two. While on this side quest of co op fun, Plate was just trying to fill out his Pokedex even more, and <laughs> we both realized that the leap forward was just here. Now, the Pokemon games have several different ways of forcing the player to beat all the gems before Victory Road. So, let's find out what Violet did. Ah, I see. Just as normal. They are going to see that I don't have all the badges and then... Oh, oh. is this really going to be possible? I mean, I'm, I'm not ready for this, but uh, okay. H hello. So, I forgot that there is supposed to be an interview. Kind of weird, but okay. We start with an easy question about how we got here and then we just got more pretty easy questions like what starter type we got and the school's main function when the interview was over uh we were told to go outside and we would find out the results uh sadly it turns out uh they wasted our time we didn't pass the assistant does let us know that they normally don't take people serious unless they have all eight batches which is kind of lame in the end with that little excursion over and <laughs> some more shenanigans later plate with the power of the interwebs learned with certain pokemon and how to actually evolve it and that had to do with gimme ghoul since being introduced to this pokemon i was pretty interested in it but before the internet i couldn't figure out how to evolve it and in its gimme ghoul form it's honestly really trash but with this newfound knowledge plate and i could actually evolve it so throughout your journey you'll find a bunch of gimme ghoul coins and you need to be holding the max amount of 999 coins for one gimme ghoul to evolve wow that is a lot an easy tech to deal with that is running to a watchtower or a runes and fighting one of these gimme ghouls they can't do much damage and after beating them you'll get a random amount which most of the time is about 50 coins if not more and with 999 coins and leveling up one of our gimme ghoul we are introduced to our special boy gold dango honestly didn't like his design at first but still enjoyed it for its rarity with how to evolve it but boy do i slowly fall in love with it hard to say if i like it more than palafin and annihilate but boy am i enjoying these weird evolving pokemon finally back here in the snow mountains we were at the ice gym it was surprisingly an easy path to get here at the gym we find nimona who wants to fight us but also 
doesn't. So in order to face the gym leader, we have to do some sick jumps on the slopes. Okay, not really jumps, but we do go down a slope with Maridon. It was super easy, but kind of wish it was uh, at least a little bit longer. It felt way too short. But with that easy challenge over, it's now time to take on the gym leader. The Snowboarder Pro Grusha. I already knew this would be an easy battle due to just having our starter, you know, Manzana Soul. But we had some fun with other Pokemon first, like using Annihilate. Sure, it would have been quicker to just use our starter, but it was really fun actually to get to use our other Pokemon. But yeah, there's the Ice Gym. And now that we have five badges, some of our Pokemon can actually listen to us. Well, s some. We still got Pokemon in 50, so uh, we got to get the next badge quick. Afterwards, we talk with what is basically the champion of this game, but isn't because that's not how it works. But while talking, Nimona joined in and is now ready to actually fight us. And yeah, it's been a bit since we last fought, so I'm ready for a real challenge. Let's go. Oh, she is very much under level. I know that I'm over leveled, but like she is below the level of the gym we literally just beat. I always liked the idea of rival battles, but this was honestly just disappointing. Time to continue heading north to our next gym. Hopefully we can outpace our Pokemon so that they can actually start listening to me. Because honestly, that's been the biggest challenge so far. With only a short trip to the next gym in Montevera, we are here in Montevera. What's with this town actually having some personality? Especially compared to just what we just saw in the last gym. The last gym didn't even have a town. It was like supposedly like a ski resort without the resort. Now, we, we still can't really explore too much of this town. Like, I, I'm still missing being able to barge into people's home. There's something about it that gave the town depth. While this is just feels kind of hollow still. Even with this town, that looks good. But either way, I think it's time to take on the ghost gym. In order for us to fight the gym leader, we actually have to help her out with her concert. Specifically, whooping on some kids in double battles to hype up the crowd. And what better way than do that with flexing on them with Palafin and our golden boy. It's also really fun because it, as it goes on with the crowd just getting wild, the stage lights up, boosting up your Pokemon, obviously making the battle easier. But like, I don't know, this just this idea and the feeling of it just felt really fun. And then we are introduced to the gym leader, MC Rhyme. So after watching a kid getting blasted, uh, sadly, Play is too much of a coward, so he doesn't accept a rap battle. But at least he still has his mind on the mission and continues to take the challenge to a gym battle. And that was the ghost gym. <laughs> With six badges, uh, level 50 Pokemon will actually start to listen to us. Sadly, some of our Pokemon are even still overleveled. Love it. Yay. But yeah, after that gym battle, we talk with Mr. Hassel, who expresses how excited he is to face us, as in fact, he is one of the Elite Fours, which is pretty cool. Then he reminds Play of his studies, and while we were planning on finishing Team Star, it sounds like we have other matters to take care of. Okay, back to school. Back to school. While we are here, we finish all of our classes. And while here, we got to learn more of Cigaro and how he struggles with pleasing others to the point of neglecting what he actually likes. And which, honestly, I could kind of relate to. Surprisingly, kind of like Cigaro a lot for that. And during the rest of our classes, the best things we really learned was about shiny Pokemon and their percentage of appearing, which is kind of cool to have a, a game literally talk about this. I know they have in the past, but getting more information is always great. 
We also learned more lore about some king in the past and his connection to the calamity and falling of the old empire. Blah, 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 lore, lore, am I right? <laughs> uh, we also got to hang out more with Mr. Hassel and learn out a little bit more about the struggles with his family ties and we're able to uh, let him know that, hey, uh, we aren't shirking our studies. All right, come on, get off our back. Jeez. And while Rifort wasn't my favorite character, uh, talking with her, we got a connection to those stakes and weird doors we've been finding. It sounds like it has to do with the lower connection to the old empire. You know that blah blah I was saying? Yeah, it seems like it actually has possibly a connection to that. With some calamity Pokemon. Ooh, spooky. Spooky legendaries. After that, we got a lot of wrap up on some character stories, which was the bright side for completing all the classes. Sure, you could say that the knowledge we learned from classes is enough, but the real reward is really getting to grow closer with the teachers at the academy. But that was all the most important parts of our journey back at the school. I don't hate that they did this. I am glad that it was optional, and since it was, I can't really complain for its reward not being amazing, since the reward is more sorry with the teachers, which is it's not nothing, but like, ugh. It is a lot of time to get here. Now, I think it's time for some unfinished business. With only two more gym badges and one last team star boss, you're clearly in the late game. But with this game's focus on exploration and taking your own time and own pace, it doesn't feel like we are almost done with this game. It feels super weird. Either way, I think we can actually take on Arvin this time. Now, none of Arvin's Pokemon are really strong. The biggest thing was the massive gap in levels. There's still a gap, but this time, it's so much less. Having about a 10 level gap at this stage of the game isn't unbeatable, but actually probably a good challenge to be honest. So even with the help of items, we had a actually tough battle against Arvin losing a lot of Pokemon, but in the end, it was another dub for Plate, which confirms our thoughts that we are going to need some more help. <laughs> yeah, aka doing the other main objectives. And yeah, that's the technical end of the Path of Legends route. Very much enjoyed it, but I guess it's time to finish the other last two main objectives. Plate's feeling pretty good. Since the Pokedex has made some massive strides, with three fourths of it already being completed, only 100 Pokemon left to capture. But I think it's finally time to deal with Team Star, like a band aid, ripping it off. Hopefully, quick. Gliding down the snowy mountain, we land in the fairy infested North Province. Both Cassipedia and Mr. Clive come by to start pumping us up for the last fight. And also recounting the point of this operation is to uh, make sure all the main bosses step down so that the hidden shadow boss of Team Star will have to force their way out so that we can take them out, forcing Team Star to officially disband. But what a mystery. Who is Cassipedia? And who even is the Shadow Boss of Team Star? Ooh, it's all spooky. All oh, so many question marks. Who could it be? After one last let's go challenge of botting a bunch of fairy types, we face the fairy type boss Ortega. Now, I was pretty worried about facing this boss. One reason was, as mentioned, this trainer focuses on fairy type. But that wasn't the only reason. I also was a bit worried because this boss being the furthest away from the starting area was a pretty good indicator of what his level was going to be. Luckily for us, this fight ended up not being as hard as it was actually fighting the other Team Star boss, Airy. That doesn't mean this was just easy though, uh, it still was a solid fight and a solid way to finish Team Star. Take that, fairy types. Yeah putting you in your place and after one final team star flashback that i really really didn't care about mr clive as per usual did some questioning to assess the situation and cast letting us know where to go now 
for the final shadow boss fight and it is real that the true identity of the shadow boss is Cassiopeia. <gasps> i know shocking and while you might argue that she could have just disbanded the group because she is litter uh, for some reason it can only be done this way by using the team's code either way time to take out the shadow boss by going to the schoolyard after dark So, at the schoolyard after dark, there is a new secret revealed. I know, nobody saw this coming, but Mr. Clive was actually, in fact, Mr. Cavill. <laughs> and then, he is also claiming to be the true shadow boss of Team Star. Whether or not I truly believe him, it's time to take on Mr. Cavill. This was honestly a pretty cool fight. That was slightly interrupted by Sunis slowly walking past the fight with no idea what was going on. I wish they had at least programmed Sunis to be watching and cheering since, since after defeating Mr. Cavill's Josuke that we could have had as a starter and defeating Mr. Cavill, he is chewed out by Miss Time for being a bad example fighting on the school grounds. I mean, it's super funny and... This was after Mr. Cavill explained that he's not in fact the Shadow Boss, but instead he was just testing her strength to see if we could actually take out the Shadow Boss. He also explained his failure for what actually happened to Deep Star and his failure as a director. Mr. Cavill's inclusion in this story has made me actually interested and care about this story a bit more, this main plot line. Sure, a story of Outcast getting even more misunderstood is interesting and makes me sympathetic, but getting to have someone a uh, part of the system that technically was part of the harm was great seeing and being able part of the journey of them actually trying to take responsibility of actually trying to fix it. And even being able to help with this final battle made me excited to be a part of it and see this little journey. Uh, but uh, sadly, by the time we got done with our epic battle with Mr. Clive, um, it was daytime. So instead of wasting our time just waiting around, I guess it was time to face some gems. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of the shadow later. Just, uh, one second. What if they got a time? Here in the bottom left corner of Paldea in Alfornada, we have the Psychic Gym. Now, Psychic Type is one of my favorite, and with it, making it one of my favorite gyms to take on. So, let's see what kind of challenge we have here. Nimona challenges to yet another battle, and hey, it's on this cool stage. Pretty sure it's going to be where we fight the gym later, but hey, still a cool stage. Sadly, the fight wasn't really that great because uh, <laughs> her team was underleveled with only having four mods, so yeah. You were able to uh, clean her tea with only her golden boy. <laughs> it was pretty sad. I guess she did say it was a warm up. I I mean, yeah, maybe in that spirit. I'm. I guess we're now ready for uh, the real fight, with the gym leader. Yeah, totally. That's what it was. Oh, yeah. I, I'm glad I got all warmed up and pumped up for this. Yeah, ready for the fight. This is this is what we uh, this is what we need right now. I mean, we get to trounce some kids in between some sets of this. So, yeah, we uh, we easily beat the test. Again, another easy test challenge thing that feels like it's extremely meant for kids that I don't think I like at all, but okay. Now it's time to take on Tulip, the makeup artist and gym leader. It's actually pretty cool to be seeing like all the gym leaders have like just jobs besides just being a gym leader. It's interesting. I mean, those gym battles don't bring in the bread, I guess, you know, especially if you're losing all the time to a bunch of trainers. Uh, speaking of losing all the time, uh, while having fun with Substitute, we were able to roll her team with just our goodest of Golden Boy. And that's the last gym. Oh, I guess there is one more. Uh, okay, let's take care of it. Remember when I said that I finished all my classes? So, okay, that was a lie. Again, another sin. Sorry. Whoops. You will unlock classes based on gyms completed, which is not a bad way to do it, but basically everything I said before about the classes related here. They are probably good to complete if you are uh, new to Pokemon games, 
But if you are someone who's played the games before, you probably already know a lot of like the changes and percentages to hit Pokemon and different moves being stabs and a lot of that kind of facts. I mean, sure, it can be good to learn more about the percentage-wise for shinies and stuff like that, but for the most part, let's be honest, if you played Pokemon games a lot, you probably don't need to be taking these classes. But after all of our classes, it was nighttime, so I guess it was a uh, better time than any to take down a wretched gang. Waiting at the schoolyard, we meet Casapia, or better yet, the real shadow leader of Team Star, Penny. Yeah, it was pretty obvious. Again, I think the problem was that they didn't even try to make it like a real mystery by putting other possible suspects, but it's fine. It's fine. It's not why I come to a Pokemon game. Oh my gosh, the real hero. He's back. Mr. Clive, uh, can't, can't believe he would show up again, at least like this, but he is important that he's here because since he is here, someone's here to actually be able to record the fight. With that being able to be done, it's finally time to officially take down Team Star. And a way to lead out with one of my favorite Pokemon, Umbreon. That kind of makes it obvious what we are facing, but it's a full EV evolution team, which is always cool to fight. I do have to be a little careful since Penny's team are in the 60s while I'm still in the 50s. But with being cautious and careful, we were able to defeat Penny and with it, one last time for the road, we got another flashback. This time about Penny explaining why the team should disband in the first place and how ultimately they refused to listen. So Penny took on the responsibility of trying to fix everything and then trying to protect her treasure all alone. Because Mr. Clive is the real G, he gathered all of the Team Star bosses and officially made his apologies for the school's mistakes. But that's not all. Mr. Cavill also made it so that the Team Star would not disband. Probably the best outcome since the group wasn't actually bad at all. Maybe just pushy with its recruiting process, but besides then, it's obviously a group that finds meaning and kinship with each other. which fits in line with the school's focus and on finding your own treasure. But there are consequences for the team's actions. But truly, their punishment is still being Team Star. But using their bases to actually challenge strangers who are out on the treasure hunt. <laughs> exactly what they are doing. But now it's actually supported, which is pretty cool. Later at Mr. Cavill's office, Penny confesses to actually hacking the school system in order to be paying play for the Starfall operation. Whoops. It's good that she confessed to it. Luckily, as part of her punishment, she is actually turns out to be helping out the Pokemon League with fixing its firewall problem. All's well, ends well. Now, with the Operation Starfall over, it's finally time to take on this final gym. In the city of Lavencia, we run into Nimona before we can take on the gym challenge to let us know that she'll be cheering us on. Cool. And what is this gym test? Well, it's simple. Where's Waldo? Well, we have the gym leader. Yeah, I know. Be a streamer. Ugh. The only bright side to this test is that Mr. Cavill was the Waldo in this minigame, which eh, I appreciated. Luckily enough, with a lot of these mini games uh they aren't too long so 
Now we can finally take on the last gym leader. Her being a content creator does critical damage to my insides. I hate it. I hate it so much. All right, Plate. Take her out for me. Yes. Do it, Plate. You've served your master well. Good. Yes. Now, with all the badges collected, we can now become the very best. Like a lot of people are, I guess. <laughs> With our team fully healed and prepped, we head inside to get interviewed once again, this time for real. At first, we got a lot of questions we got previously, but then we got questions like which was the hardest gym and what typing they were. Plate being traumatized from our first gym, Kofu chose him, of course. But after answering some questions that seemed too simple, like if we even like Pokemon, we passed the interview and was able to finally take on the Elite Four. Okay, it has to be said. I know a lot of what I've said in this journey video has already been discussed in other videos, but I still think it needs to be said. This room sucks. <laughs> now it does evoke the feeling of a training room like something I would recognize from Dragon Ball Z, but besides Pokemon Red and Green kind of getting a pass for their Elite Four room being kind of just similar but color coordinated um this doesn't really get that this doesn't feel special or different at all it just feels bland and blank like a training room it just it doesn't it doesn't work but that doesn't matter much now though because it's time to take on rika since having palafin our strategy kind of as per usual has been having paladin lead and us flip turning to switch out one, activating his super cool superhero ability, and two, allowing us to assess the situation and knowing who to actually set out next. So far, every battle we've had with main traders have been typed focused. Nothing new to Pokemon, but wish cash out, we had the question of whether or not Rico was a electric trainer or a water trainer. And finally, after several Pokemon going down, we were able to take out her wish cash which revealed her next Pokemon to be Camera. This honestly caught me off guard, but made me super excited. To me, it makes sense that the Elite Four would be the top challenge, which shouldn't be shackled to a type challenge like we've already done all game with the gyms. This is an awesome change here, and I, oh, I love it. So, wait. No, she's a crap type trainer. Why? Uh, why are we still doing this? Why? Uh, okay, maybe I wasn't really focused on this fight and lost. Okay, okay, maybe, maybe I forgot a wish cash was a ground type. Okay, mistakes were made. Okay, it honestly is a challenging fight. And just to clarify, I wasn't trying to make that a bit. I was actually really excited for the Elite Four trainers to not be stuck to one type. And I'm really disheartened that it is stuck to a type. But on our second attempt, we were able to defeat Rika, the very first Elite Four member. Now to see who else we got to face. Next up was Poppy, a literal child. Back in my day, you had to be 10 years old to get a Pokemon. Look at her, Elite Four. Jeez. After defeating Poppy's first Pokemon, Copper Jura, we were able to confirm that Poppy is in fact a Steel type trainer by sending out Bronzar. I'm glad at least that the Elite Four trainer has used unique types at least, but while well, Poppy was intimidating at first, I had nothing to fear since my spicy apple was able to <laughs> roll Poppy's team. Two down, two more to go. And if you thought I was surprised to fight a little child, I was especially surprised to find out that our next opponent was the MVP himself, Larry. Not only is he a gem leader, but he's also an Elite Four member. What a man. Now the only check on the list is if he falls God, am I right, ladies? At first, it seems as though he was a grass type, which, while not the strangest type, it was interesting that they did not keep Larry a normal type like his gym, but changed it. 
pretty cool. After taking down the banana shin Tropius, though, he learned that the Elite Four Larry was actually a fly type, not necessarily a basic type to find around as a trainer. Pretty cool. I mean, sadly, it's still a flying type, so it's not really one of the best typings. Uh, so his Pokemon weren't really that nasty. I mean, he did have a, a few, but we were able to cook him well done and beat the third Elite Four member, Larry. We then got this funny scene with Larry, which is great, and that reminds me, one positive to this game having the Elite Four battle happen in this one room is that Elite Four members don't leave the room, but instead watch for entertainment. Super believable and enjoyable, and again, it reminds me of Dragon Ball Z for some reason. Yes, as I was talking, the final Elite Four member, Mr. Hazel, joined the fray. No doubt he has Dragon type, so, you know, his family and all connections, you know how it is. And yeah, dragon types. I wonder what kind of dragons we are gonna see. Oh my gosh, it's, it's Gorgira. It's actually him. Oh my gosh. I mean, okay, discount him, but that is literally Godzilla. You can't say what it. You can't say it's not. Oh my gosh, I want it so much. With a powerful Draco meter, you're able to defeat the mighty king of monsters, and with it, defeat the last Elite Four member, Mr. Hassel. Hard to say if this was the worst Elite Four experience. Um, that probably still goes to Sun and Moon, but but either way, there's no time to comprehend the last few matches. It is time to face the champion of champions. I mean, okay. The whole face in the champion at the end doesn't really work uh, with this game and how it works, but either way, it's, it's time. La Primera, here we come. So, you say you don't know your own strength. Well, Let's see if Game Freak throws any weight into that statement. Oh, not really a Pokemon I cared about, but maybe it's actually really good. Okay, well, one's down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The next Pokemon was Avalor, which I was able to one shot with Golden Boy. <laughs> Still doesn't even have his signature move yet. I, I'm starting to worry about this fight. Okay, at least her next Pokemon is a cool Pokemon, which we make sure to body instantly. And then Goku, what? I mean, Goku isn't trash. I mean, but it's for sure not a strong, amazing Pokemon. All right, another one down and oh, can't say this one is bad. It's, it's a new one. Don't know it, to be honest. <laughs> okay, it, it can do that. Probably not the smartest play on my part. Sorry, plate. Don't worry, Primate is already dead. They're, Something like that. Take it up with the lore. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. Because our hero, Palafin, was able to save the day. And you were taken down easily. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe, that, maybe that's a bit much. Look, don't go around saying you have a problem at going too hard and then not go hard at all. That's, that, that's so disrespectful, if anything. Gosh. The next thing that happens here is probably unforgivable. Game Freak has to respond to this. As we head to the back entrance, something wretched happens. Did you miss it? Because the game did. Where is my recording your champion team? Now, okay, okay. I'm not actually real upset. Well, okay, I am. But I'm not actually feeling entitled enough to claim that Game Freak has to change anything. But I will say that I am, again, as I kind of have been saying for the last while, I'm super bummed that there isn't any normal loading team record that they've done in the past. I assume it has to do something with how you can complete the game in different ways and how the saving the team has been used to basically say, good job, you finished the game. But even still, like either way, as as I've ranted on since I've become champion rank and on the bonus level, it's finally time to have a serious battle as rivals. Yeah, off to Mesagoza because my idea of special is not the very first place we fought, but oh well.
All right, time to take care of Nimona. I'm curious if her team is any different, but either way, she's going down this first time for sure. Oh boy, yeah, that is some level gap. I keep just doing one objective from the next, so we aren't getting too many level ups, but I, I guess we did want a challenge. Uh, while some Pokemon of hers are the same, like her Rock Dog, she does have some different Pokemon, like Gudra, which is cool to see. Oh, oh gosh, well, <laughs> it was a risk. Goodbye. <laughs> Time for the final battle between our starters. I don't know about you, but I always like using my starters against my rival starter. It, it was a bit cooler when the rival actually picked a strategic starter, but I still can't help but do it to this day. It's just oh, it's such a great way to finish a fight. So yes, we beat Nimona, and our rivalry continues. But now that we have accomplished all three main objectives, we can actually help out the professor, thanks to our friends. So, it's time to call in some favors. Following a small path southeast of Medalla, we made it to Area Zero. Well, at least the front door to it. Here waiting for us already is Nimona and Penny, who were already contacted by Arvin about the basic situation and the favor we needed from them. Without much information, Professor Turo lets us know that what he needs for us is to head down into the Great Crater. Not really surprised, but I am kind of interested in how we are going to actually help the professor out. I guess only one way to find out, and that's playing the game. Once on the ground, our boy Maraidon starts acting a bit seasick, forcing himself back into his ball, most likely due to his trauma. You know, the one that Arv and I have previously talked about. Sorry, little guy. So now the game plan is to unlock the main doors down to the deepest part of Area Zero, which is locked behind several different labs on the way down. Sounds simple to me. Finally at this place, I'm, I'm a little disappointed at how there are a bunch of Pokemon we've been looking at all game. I was kind of expecting some dangerous Pokemon or something. As we descend down into the crater, Arvin and everyone started talking to us. Now, this is the first time in this game that they are talking like this, and while I 
get the immersion of getting to talk as we journey. Uh, problem comes when there isn't voice acting and I'm trying to read the actual enjoyable dialogue, but I'm struggling because I don't just want to stop and listen. But when I'm getting into the middle of things, it can be hard to actually read the text. Overall, it's a fun bonding moment with the crew, which makes me think of what it would be like if they created a Pokemon game that worked a lot like a traditional RPG, where you controlled multiple characters, but they all limited what Pokemon they got, except the pro tag, which could switch out his Pokemon throughout the game. And the main idea you could hit on is actually going on a journey together with your friends and the idea of that kind of feeling that kind of the anime has done well for the Pokemon series. Kind of just weird thoughts I've had. As I rambled on, we make it to the first lab where we get attacked by the same Pokemon that La Primera had. Which isn't normal Pokemon, I guess. So yeah, we bully it. <laughs> With a lot of <coughs> bonding aside, we head into the lab where the professor gives some lore before we unlock the first um, lock. With more conversation about abandonment issues and the pain that caused, we find the next lab. But we're not alone because we found this weird little guy. Oh my gosh, kill it! Kill it with fire! After eliminating uh, that probably endangered form of Deli Bird, we head inside the lab where we discuss what we just saw and how it's probably actually the crazy Pokemon we've been told about uh, to be in this area. Zero. Kind of surprised that it took this long to find, but now Plate is getting pumped just to get a more Pokemon that he could possibly catch. And that's about when the professor chimes in to inform us that the Pokemon that are out there are actually Pokemon from the future. After defeating the future Dawn fan, which was our second Titan Pokemon and not getting any more future Pokemon after that, I kind of forgot that this was part of the game. But yeah, also the professor literally says that at the bottom of the lab, there was a literal time machine. I already wish they did more tomfoolery with this. I mean, using the time machine, you could do so much with this. And I feel like ugh, we just now getting to hear about it. Ugh. Never mind. Humans can't return to the present. It's worthless. Scrap the project. I'm going home. Not worth it. Plate disciples the next lock. Arvin gives us the Violet Book for some reason. And we continue our descent. The journey itself feels a little boring. While the music has a spooky sci-fi vibe that sounds really great, the area itself just still feels a little lackluster. My biggest problem is that while Play is able to catch some Pokemon he hasn't evolved, I wish we were actually seeing new Pokemon. Like, give me more of that Deli Bird. That's all I'm asking. At the third lab, as per usual, we get attacked by our good old friend, Mechadon Fan. Wasn't much of a fight, uh, speaking of old friends, uh, once in the lab, speaking of old friends, once in the lab, Penny brings up the possibility that Maridon is probably a future Pokemon too, which makes sense because Arvin literally said that he was from Area Zero. Checks out to me, rudely enough. The professor chimes in once more for another lore dump, uh, this time about Maridon explaining that he in fact was the very first Pokemon to be retrieved from the time machine. Which sounds kind of terrifying if you think of it. The professor also explains how he was able to recover two Maridons from the future. So much for legendary Pokemon. After more talk about how because they are the same Pokemon they're probably family. Which just thinking of the probability of that sounds highly unlikely. We disabled the next lock even though at this point I'm kind of feeling a twist coming and kind of think we might be accidentally releasing the bad guy or something to that end but i have to uh i have to do it to play the game so hopefully i'm wrong only one more lock to disable it's finally at this point as we descend deeper down that we get into a crystal cave a area that i was actually expecting down here while the constant dialogue between the trainers can feel like it's I don't know, grinding? While the constant dialogue between the trainers can feel like it's grinding the pacing of the game to a halt, I think it's one of the major points for this area. Not the slowness itself, but actually trying to build this connection between the characters. 
which while I wish that could have been done more throughout the actual game as a whole of these NPCs interacting together, I do love that they are trying to give them some time now. Speaking of now, uh, we finally get to the last lab, uh, but there's something wrong, something very wrong, but not wrong enough to not disable the lock. That's a, that's for sure. <laughs> Making the final gate down below able to open, we get a small explanation for the professor that these crystals are super cool and they are actually the reason as to why we have a bunch of stuff like Terra. That whole technology are from these crystals. The professor then warns us that when we open the Pokemon, some dangerous Pokemon are going to find us. <laughs> Great to warn us now. Well, no time like the present. Okay, never mind. Arvis suggests that we should probably have Maridon's help if we are going to fight some dangerous Pokemon, which I guess does make sense. So now, with Maridon here, we proceed to open the gate. Honestly, thought they were uh, going to have the other Maridon actually be the other box art legendary. I know that so far in this story, the Maridon aren't really legendaries, but just common Pokemon from the future. But still, it's, it's just weird seeing multiple of the same legendary Pokemon. Oh, but uh, here comes <laughs> the dangerous Pokemon. And boy, are there a lot of them. Luckily enough, we are able to do double team some of the Pokemon one at a time to bully them, including this cool looking Paradox Hariyama with slight help from Rhydon and Nimona and Penny running after the other Pokemon, Arvin and Plate team up to double team some more of the Pokemon until finally Arvin decides to deal with the rest on his own for some reason while we go ahead and help the professor i don't i don't know why we can't just finish the business here and then go together but uh, okay plate complies and heads into lab zero and it's inside the lab that we find Wait, what? Uh, AI, kill it! Kill it! You kill it in battle! I don't care if you have to fight it in battle, it's fine. I've seen tournament. Okay, well, I haven't seen tournament. I've been meaning to, but still. Kill it! Kill it, AI. It's a problem. Kill it. So, yeah. Plot twist. Uh, <laughs> not Professor Turo, but, uh, instead a, uh, AI version of him. It turns out the professor has been dead for a long time. Jeez. I mean, I was kind of expecting maybe, like, a future Turo, but... I wasn't expecting this. So, turns out not Turo needs our uh, help to shut down the time machine because messing with time is bad. I was feeling a twist coming, but to actually have the professor in this game be the quote unquote bad guy in this game is crazy. I love it, but it's crazy. It's a bit of a bummer uh, that we find out the professor's motives through text. You know, it's not the best storytelling method of telling instead of showing, but we find out the professor was wanting to make a living world for both future and present Pokemon. Why? I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure in Scarlet it has to do with the past, so maybe it would make more sense. Either way, no, they both don't make sense. It's just obviously bad for the ecosystem. It's just, uh, why? Why? Doesn't make sense. Someone, someone had to tell them just no. 
that was the problem. So the question now is, why are we needed for this task? Well, in the time machine room, we are finally told by not Turo that we need to use the professor's ID, which is in the Violet book. But this wasn't just a fetch quest, because Naturo is worried that once we try to put down the time machine, that Naturo will be forced to stop us because of his, his security measure code. Which does make sense. Kinda think that Naturo is putting a lot of faith into a child, but okay, time to destroy a time machine. Oh my gosh, what a introduction to a fight. Oh my god. And how he just gets Pokemon for the time machine and drops Oh my It's great. It's great. And not to mention he's 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 actually really tough. <laughs> this is a really tough fight. Having to deal with different future Pokemon that you might have not have faced before, forcing you to figure out their typing and weaknesses while just taking massive damage and still being on a level. Oh, Luckily, at this point, the level gap isn't too egregious. The thing that got me throughout the fight was every time Natura would just send in a new Pokemon. It was so intimidating. This had to be one of my favorite boss fights in like such a long time. So, after using a bunch of items, <laughs> we were able to defeat Natura. The squad shows up right after the fight to see a glitchy not Turo saying thanks and giving one last message to Arvin before With yet another twist, we must fight on, even though we can't use our Pokemon, except maybe. I love moments like this in gaming. The bait and switch of mechanics. Uh, Earthbound was great with it, and but uh, I still love it here, and it's awesome to see it uh, with this last fight of Rhydon versus Rhydon. With some cool moves, 
some close calls, and, you know, just support from your friends. Plates Maridon was able to be victorious. What a great emotional fight. Back to a bit of his sense, Natura begins recounting how jealous he is that we've been able to fulfill the main plot of this game and having the freedom of finding our own treasure. He explains that while he is here, he will be forced to keep the machine going. So in order to keep it from rebuilding, he, he's going to use the time machine to go to the future. You know, get it? Because he's not actually human. I know, crazy. He does admit that it's not totally selfless, but this will be a way for him to go and find his own treasure. So, after giving one last apology to Arvin. With Naturo gone, Arvin tries to come to terms with everything, from his father being gone for sure and all the pain with that. The party does its best to comfort Arvin in this time, and we finally go on one last journey and head home. What a game. Can I just say that? What a game. I saw some other people's statements, some other Pokemon fans, and I am in the same boat as them. This is one of the funnest I've ever had with a Pokemon game. True statement. Is this the best Pokemon game? Is this a perfect Pokemon game? No. There's so many flaws in this game. Even just avoiding the, the frame rate and, and the jittering and the pop-ins, even avoiding all of that problems, there's still flaws in this game. There's stuff that could be better. This is not a 10 out of 10, not even a 9 out of 10. But open world in this game and the emphasis on exploration, I loved. I loved a lot. I, I already mentioned it, but I think it really truly captured a massive idea of Pokemon and what makes Pokemon games so great. I think they did good on that. I also think some of their storytelling was amazing. I really enjoyed Arvin's story plotline. Again, I should mention for a Pokemon game, you know, uh, I can only compare it with that. I can compare it with the other RPGs and as overall, it's storytelling is kind of, it's all right. It's okay. It's nothing too crazy. It's nothing that hasn't already been done. Even its final boss and that whole twist even that is not a 10 out of 10 storytelling. It's great and amazing, and I'm, I'm here for it in this Pokemon game. I'm glad to have more plot lines like this in Pokemon. Now, even though its plot lines isn't 10 out of 10, you know, the Star Bomb, that whole quest line, wasn't too crazy about it. Even, even the, the, the following Nimona and that plot line, it was alright. It was okay. But overall, I think this is the funnest I've ever had in this game. 
And I think it is mostly because of that exploration. Just getting to explore wherever I want. Now, I still think they should do the, the gym challenge the way I think of you have it at a set level and then once you get a badge, every gym goes up a level because then you can even get more wild with how you explore and what path you take. Harder to do? Probably. So I, I understand I'm not a game designer, so ooh, I'm not going to be trying to really force other people to tell them how to do their job when, let's be honest, I'm, I'm not qualified. <laughs> Now, what I do want to talk about now is probably the game's main theme, its main idea. And that has to do with its clash of individuality, and then on top of that, finding your purpose. Going on a treasure hunt, what truly means to you in finding that in life? I think, as I mentioned at the beginning of the game, while it's a little bit of a somewhat secular idea, at least nowadays, this modern look of individuality is very secular in the mindset there and very much pushed. But I think it works really well. I think it works well in this setting of going on an adventure. I think it fits very perfectly and that's why I was all for it. I was all for it in this game and I enjoyed the idea of it. I think it worked for a theme. Talking about the theme and how, how it's a secular thing, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Individuality and, and that idea, that concept is not a bad thing at all. It's funny. It, it's a lot of people look at when they look at the kind of the main first start of this and a lot of ways it's looked back at Christianity. Christianity is one of the starters of it because the idea of Jesus Christ coming down and saying you are saved through my death and resurrection it's from me it's not from you it doesn't matter if you're Jewish doesn't matter if you're a Gentile doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter if you're slave or free no matter what no matter what you can do you are saved through me, through accepting my gift to you of my salvation. Like, that was one of the first starts of individuality, of it doesn't matter who you are. Now, this concept in general in this game, I was kind of surprised to see it so heavily pushed because in a lot of cultures like South Asia and Japan, the idea of the communal life, your identity is more connected with where you're from, what you were born into, a lot of that. Like you are Japanese, like that is highly valued. And to being outside, it holds a lot of weight. And the idea, even the idea of your purpose in life, your purpose isn't for your self-fulfilling role, it's for the common good, it's for the group, it's for the community. So I was kind of surprised to see it in this game from its location. Not saying that every single person from Japan thinks a single way. Like, that's that's too single-minded to think and too shallow, I would say. But I was surprised to see it here, just this idea and emphasis on it. Now, there's pros and cons to both views. I would have to say that neither view is bad. It kind of reminds me again with Christianity and how the, the family of Christ, how it's it's not just one or the other. It's, it's a mix of both. I think some people got the notion that it's more on just the communal side uh because you get you hear these words of like-minded uh we are of the christian body we are of christ we it seems like oh now that we're christian we follow the bible that means we are carbon carbon copies of each other we are just one way when that's not quite how it is like uh right here in the bible right here first corinthians 12 it talks about the body of christ and how it's built up of many parts so it has the idea of we are unified we are making up one body, but there's an ear, there's an arm, there's a finger. They all have different parts, different rules, and they do different things, and it's beautiful. Now, there's another part to it that's connected, the treasure, the, the finding your purpose. I'm used to seeing this around my age and growing up and this emphasis of what do you want to be like when you grow up? What is your purpose in life? Where do you find fulfillment in life? And a lot of people stress about this. You know, there's a heavy weight on this of, hey, what are you gonna do? Don't waste time, you gotta do this. And I think a lot of people hold their values too much connected to this, that if I can't find one, a purpose, then I'm worthless. And two, they put everything into what is their purpose. Sometimes people not having a hobby, sometimes people not being able to just understand that you can fail. You could try to find what is your purpose and fail and that's okay understanding that maybe you don't know your purpose and maybe your purpose will change. Stuff like that, it, it's stressful for people and sometimes people need to hear that. 
to actually understand and be able to calm down, breathe, and not stress so much of this weight. Because a lot of people can apply that pressure. And I felt it too. I felt it growing up. I even felt it as a Christian, as a Christian feeling of, oh, what is God's will for my life? What does he want me to do as a career path? And not wanting to disappoint. As a Christian, all I had to do is share God's word. I got to show love to others. That's it. That's all I got to do. <laughs> so it was interesting seeing these topics in these games and seeing how they attacked it. I think, again, I think it fits so perfectly in a Pokemon adventure of being a kid, going out in the world and finding what matters to you. What are your values? Like we had different characters like Penny's, her, her friends and that bond of, of the group is, it's great to see. That was like the positive of that storyline was getting to see that. Those are my thoughts on this game. I enjoyed it a lot. Boy, there are some flaws. There, there are some serious flaws in this game. I won't, I won't lie. Probably my biggest problem with this game, and I think it's a massive flaw, and it's, it has to be talked about. And I think it's its open nature. I think I've explained it a little bit, but because of its openness and it's so pushed on exploration, I mentioned this a little bit, but I didn't want to explore any of the towns, any of the cities. When I think of this game and its identity, besides going out and exploring, I don't find anything that I connect with of like, oh yeah, that's what I think of when I think of this game. Different older Pokemon games, they always have a, a, a feeling. They have specific towns that hit you in such a way and you spend enough time in them that you actually can remember them. You can imagine them and, and that feeling that they give off, the, the, the emphasis of their theme. You can, you can feel that and you can hear music just by thinking of certain places in different towns of old Pokemon games. And this, there's not any towns that I can think of that I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that music. That music's rememberable. This Pokemon game kind of feels shallow for what it is. I think my overall thoughts with this game is that I think it's a beautiful, it's a great mechanical game. The exploration, those type of stuff is what made the game good and made it to where I enjoyed it up to the end. What they need to do <laughs> is find a way to have the old charm of the older Pokemon games of actually getting to spend time in towns, actually getting to build relationships with people. Because with this, it ended up feeling pretty empty. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave a like. Most importantly, please subscribe and hit the bell because as you can tell, these videos don't come out so often. <laughs> I hope they do and I'm gonna keep trying on trying to get them out sooner if possible, but there's a bit of a quality I want to bring to you guys. So yeah, hit that bell so you can actually be notified when a new video comes out. Definitely would appreciate. And yeah, thank you again for watching this. I hope you enjoyed this video and i hope you enjoyed pokemon violet and scarlet i know i did i didn't hate it but yeah but that's probably it for now i gotta go go work on more games all right all right all right see ya